what it means to be a law, a theory, or a hypothesis. And it also goes into like how we do science. You know, when do we accept or reject our hypotheses? And then uh, chapter two, that's on like the themes in science. Like we talk about the central paradigm of biology being evolution by natural selection. We talk about what evolution is, what natural selection is and is not. And also we define life, which is hard, but kind of fun, which is a test question, by the way. And then we, uh, I also talk about emergent properties. And then the third chapter, a lot of people, you know, honestly, chemistry is not everybody's thing. And there's lots of reasons why it's not everybody's thing. And that's because it's abstract. You know, we don't really see a chemical. We see, you know, the, the conglomeration of all these chemicals. But as a biologist, I've got a fondness for chemistry because everything is, is chemistry when it comes to biology. Well, not everything, but it starts with chemistry. And this chapter three, I love it because it, it, it's how we can uh, realize that we are connected to the universe. And I always like that, thinking that, you know, we're stardust, that the, that the elements, the carbon, the nitrogen, the oxygen inside of us, um, that those uh, were made inside of stars that lived and died billions of years ago. And even those elements are made up of electrons, neutrons, and protons that were made in the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. So yeah, the carbon inside of you has had this amazing journey. And I always like discussing that at the beginning of chapter three. My daughter's having a meltdown. She's five. Those things happen. She hasn't had a nap today. And it's about that time of the bewitching hour. Okay, so when it came to um, having uh, email questions, I got one good question. And this was, when is evidence in an experiment significant? Okay, and she goes on to say something about it being 95% of the results are not due to random chance, but how are we supposed to know if we're not actually running the statistical test in the class to determine it? Well, doing statistics in Bio 1140, we're not going to do that in this class. And she's right. How do you know that if you don't run this in the stats? You don't. But what the whole purpose of me showing you about significance is that whenever we do an experiment, like, let's say you want to test whether or not doing cardio 30 minutes, five times a week causes weight loss. And you do this on 100 people. And then you do 100 people that you don't do the cardio on. And then you come back and measure their weight after, you know, eight weeks. And you realize that, you know, the control, the experimental group only lost like a quarter of a pound over eight weeks. Well, is that actually due to cardio or is that due to random chance? And the idea of doing statistics saying that it's a significant difference is saying that we're saying that the that, that result is not due to random chance. We're 95% certain that that difference would be caused by doing uh, cardio. Well, it turns out that you know, decades of experiments, decades has shown that if you do cardio, you might not lose weight. In fact, most experiments show that, the, that any weight loss is usually not significant. It's not about the amount of weight loss. It's just that the weight loss is random because other people gain weight. Uh, but exercise is still very, very important for our health, which I, I try to make that point. So yeah, so if you don't run the test, you don't really know that would something you would do in a higher level biology and stats class. Okay, Renee, is there a study guide? No, the study guide are the PowerPoints. And you also had three quizzes that, uh, um, that you took to get ready for this. And basically those PowerPoints and the required reading have lots and lots of information and they are the things that you need to study to know. All right. I mean, <clears throat> yeah. So I don't make study guides for this class anymore. So yeah. Is a test recorded or just a lockdown browser? Fantastic question. I started out, I was going to have it do a, uh, put a camera on everybody. And I was like, no, no, we're not going to do that. Just have a lockdown browser. And can you review the quizzes? The answer is no, actually. And the reason why is because every time I've made quizzes available in an online class, they end up on online sites. And then I have to go and tell the online sites to take them down. And then, you know, students just start, you know, Googling the questions. And then I have to like, well, I do it anyways. I, I rewrite questions all the time, but I, there's only so many ways I can answer that. Okay. What should we look back over? Is there any key points off the top of your head? 
so I can tell you that, you know, questions on this test are like there. I, I literally, when I wrote the test, I was going through the PowerPoints. That should be a big hint. And I'm not doing a, a, a camera on you, but it is timed at 75 minutes and you can backtrack. But I have questions on there about is science open to all possible explanations? You know, so make sure you understand that. Uh, know about the differences between a law, a theory, a hypothesis. Uh, you want to know like what makes a what makes a hypothesis scientific? Like what what are the criteria for hypotheses? Things like you should uh, with a hypothesis, you know, it has to be at least potentially testable and falsifiable. And someone's asking me which PowerPoint should we look at? Well, there's three of them, right? So one for chapter one, one for chapter two, and one for chapter three. Yeah, there's so the thing is, is this class, you know, it's it's not just a non-majors class for, uh, you know, like a bio 11, 10. It's a little bit harder than a bio 10 because it's required for nursing. So there is some things that you need to make sure you study. And, you know, the, the study time for this class, you know, I expect, you know, an hour or so a day of reviewing your notes and going over it. Um, so look at, uh, there's three PowerPoints. I'm updating uh, chapter two right now. It's just minor updates. All the updates on the PowerPoints are Basically, to make sure that the that the quiz questions can be answered by the PowerPoints. All right, so like I've added in extra information on there for you. You so as I go along talking about things you want to know, you want to know about emergent properties. You want to know that the cell is the basic unit of life. You want to know about like where does carbon, oxygen, nitrogen come from? What's our connection to the universe? right? Those come from stars that lived and died billions of years ago. Um, you want to know about anecdotal data, all right? Um, anecdotal data. Here's one of my favorite examples. I love my Mountain Dew, diet Mountain Dew. I quit drinking real sugar. I love Mountain Dew. And every day that I drink a Mountain Dew, I don't catch a cold. Therefore, drinking Mountain diet Mountain Dew prevents colds. That's anecdotal data. It could be right. It could be wrong. In this case, it's almost certainly wrong because I'm sure that the sucralose and yellow number five and brominated vegetable oil in my Mountain Dew is not preventing colds. There's there's no mechanism there. Other anecdotal data. Yeah. Have you ever heard somebody say that uh, I, they take vitamin C and it helps them get over a cold faster? That nah, doesn't work. Anecdotal data. Um, I went hiking, lost weight. Anecdotal data. The difference there is, while that's an anecdotal datum, it does make sense because you can, if you do hike enough, if you hike like I did, I was going five, six miles a day, first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. And I lost about 15 pounds doing that over six months. Most people don't do that. So, yeah. Okay. So make sure you know the difference between uh, the definitions of facts, laws, theories, uh, know that by the evolution by natural selection, that that is the central paradigm to biology because it makes all of our field make sense. It, it explains why there's you know, 2 million species in the world, but yet we all share like 130 different metabolic pathways. Isn't that amazing? You know, not just a genetic code, but it also is important because even though a mouse and a human and a fruit fly are different animals, we're still animals. We do things really similarly, and we can study fruit flies, tiny worms, and mice, and zebrafish to understand about our own development because there's unity in biology. Okay, is it is it timed? Yes, 75 minutes. Okay, uh, you want to know about the relationship between evolution and natural selection? Like, remember this: that evolution um, is is a is a fact. Right? I know. We, we always go, is it a fact or a theory? Make sure you know that. Species change over time, right? We can observe that. We can measure it. We can test for it. And because of these things, it qualifies as a fact. It, it actually exists or happens. But then somebody else will say, you know, is, it a, is evolution a theory? Well, evolution is just a theory. Well, evolution by natural selection is a theory because natural selection explains why species change over time. So the theory is the explanation of the fact that species change over time. Is it open? No. 
there's no camera on you, but you're going to be under a spondus lockdown. So however you want to deal with that. Okay. Know about null hypotheses and alternative hypotheses. Uh, you want to know about the difference between hodotrophs, heterotrophs, how do producers, consumers, how they store energy. You want to know a little bit about energy flows through uh, ecosystems, right? Because, uh, you know, most for most ecosystems, um, energy comes in as light, electromagnetic radiation, that's sunlight, and most of it exits as heat. Not all of it. Some of it does. Okay. I will come back to your covalent bonds here. I'm just kind of talking about stuff you guys want to know here, but I will definitely explain uh, covalent bonds and how they form. You need to know about the properties of water. You need to know what something that's hydrophobic is water fearing, doesn't dissolve in water. Think olive oil. Something that's hydrophilic will dissolve in water. Think sugar, salt, because it can form hydrogen bonds or disassociate in water. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so Sophia, your question on uh, covalent bonding. You do want to know in chapter three about atomic structure. You need to know uh, uh, protons, neutrons, electrons. You need to know that electrons you know, are outside the nucleus. You need to know that the, the, the most outermost shell is a valence shell. And let's see here, important notice, fee schedule. I can write on that. I don't have much paper. I, let's see here. It's hard to draw an atom really simply here. This would be the nucleus. And then this circle would be the inner shell. And then this would be the outer shell. And this, of course, would be the valence electrons. And if I had something like carbon, carbon's going to have four electrons and two here. So it's, you know, it's going to have six. So it's got six protons, six neutrons, six electrons out here. These valence electrons are really important. And the reason why is because for carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, they want to have a total of eight valence electrons. So carbon with only four doesn't have uh, a full set, doesn't have what's called the octet set. So what they do, and this is your, your question's very good, it they do is called a, um, a covalent bond. So here's hydrogen. Hydrogen's element number one, it's only got one electron. Well, that inner shell needs two, so it shares an electron with the carbon that forms a covalent bond. So I form four covalent bonds with carbon, okay? So that sharing of these outer shells, these outer electrons, that's your valence electrons, that forms a covalent bond. And we'll see methane is written like this right here. There's a carbon and there's a covalent bond. So there's also the covalent bonds and the covalent bonds can be shared equally between the elements. So carbon and hydrogen, that would be a nonpolar covalent bond because they're being shared equally. And then if you have something like water, oxygen has a property that it likes electrons. So it pulls the electrons toward it in these covalent bonds and you get what is called a polar covalent bond. Yeah. One day, when I get my office built, which will be soon, it's, it's built. I got to move into it. Um, this right here represents a, a polar covalent bond. And so water is a polar molecule. So that can actually form what's called hydrogen bonds, which is an attraction between these guys right here. And the hydrogen bond right there, they're not sharing electrons. This is like a weak electrostatic attraction. Think opposites attract, right? So partial positive, partial negative, they attract. Like I said, once I have my office built, I'll have a chalkboard or a whiteboard that I can go out there and write on. Okay, so Sophia, yes, what's the difference between polar and nonpolar? So this is very important. So if I have methane, which is natural gas, this would be a nonpolar covalent bond because you're sharing these electrons equally. 
And then this would be a polar covalent bond because you're sharing the electrons unequally. The oxygen is more electronegative. Um, so it sets up a polar molecule so they can form hydrogen bonds, which is that weak attraction between molecules. It can also be within a molecule too, but we're not too worried about that right now. And then of course, one more thing with the bonds, the ionic bonds, uh, they're, they're considered strong bonds by chemists, but ionic bonds are an attraction between oppositely charged ions. So if I take sodium and chlorine, sodium chloride, table salt, put them in water, they disassociate it, it falls apart, and you've got a sodium ion and a chloride ion. Okay, so those are the three types of bonds, and that's on the test. There, there are multiple questions about that. So Sophia, I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, you'll need to know about isotopes. All right, remember, you've got a carbon, element number six, six protons, six electrons, and it can have six neutrons, that'd be carbon 12, that's the mass, six plus six is 12. The, pro, the atomic number is six. You can have carbon with seven neutrons and carbon with eight neutrons. So you can have carbon 12, 13, and 14. And that, that's important because those are isotopes. We use those isotopes in science to answer a lot of questions about ecology. We can understand, we can use isotopes to reconstruct past climates, to reconstruct ecosystems, to follow um, pollution in environments actually, or determine where it's coming from. We can use isotopic ratios in medicine, especially uh, radioisotopes to track where, how metabolic processes, chemical reactions are going and to see the action of uh, um, how some medicines might work. So those, those have lots and lots of uh, uses, those isotopes. Okay, so, yep, those are all the questions that are out there. And then when we come to like um, um, chemical reactions, say you've got like uh, glucose. Um, I'm really out of paper here. Didn't prepare very well. Aha, my daughter's painting. Backside is good. Okay, so let's say you take a molecule like glucose. No, he's eat, eating my dinner over there. And had to had to stop that really quick. Okay, we could take a chemical reaction. This is glucose plus oxygen yields carbon dioxide and water. This is a chemical reaction. And in a chemical reaction, you break all the bonds holding these together, and then you rearrange those elements into new molecules. So I've got six carbons here. I've got six carbons there. Yep. I've got 12 hydrogens here. I've got 12 hydrogens over here. I have, oh, let's see how many. I've got 18 oxygens here, 18 oxygens over there. So the elements do not get, you know, re do not get changed in a chemical reaction, but you do break the chemical bonds, which takes energy to break a chemical bond. And then you rearrange those elements into new molecules. That's important. That's a good test question. Okay, let's see here. Ionic bond solution. Oh yeah, you'll need to know about pH. pH of seven is neutral. Anything higher than that is alkaline or basic. Anything below that is considered uh, acidic. Okay. And so the way that we measure pH is, a, is how many protons you have. So if anything is donating protons, hydrogen ions, it's becoming acidic. Anything that removes that is going to become basic. So you definitely want to review uh, the carbonic acid and carbonate in terms of how that acts as a buffer inside of your blood, because there's a question on there about that. Okay. Evolution, we got all these things. Don't forget organic chemistry based on carbon. Um, yeah, all right. May, uh, understand the good definition of life. I'm, I, I, I've walked away from a lot of the textbook definitions a long time ago, and I came up kind of with my own way of thinking about life based on some work by a guy named Nick Lane. And then in recent years, um, I've kind of gone back to just having the NASA definition of life. It's kind of boring, but it's really compact and it tells you so much. And that NASA definition of life is a self-sustaining chemical chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. It's one of my favorite for, uh, definitions of life these days. 
Um, emergent properties, you need to know that life is an emergent property. You can't always figure out everything just by knowing the parts. Um, chemical reactions, and then know about homeostasis. And that's maintaining the internal environment um, regardless of what the surrounding is. So like right now, it's stupidly cold outside and windy. I go outside, no matter how cold it is, my body tries to maintain around 98 degrees. Forget that 98.6. That's that's it's it's uh, become part of our of our public knowledge that is not accurate. It's not correct, actually. Um, it's based off of a mistake, but it just keeps perpetuating itself in our our cultural knowledge. Uh, your average temperature is around 97 to 98 and it fluctuates during the day, fluctuates based on your age, how much you exercise. Um, yeah, your sex, all of these things, it, it fluctuates. But the point is about homeostasis is, is your your cells or any organism tries to maintain some type of internal environment that's different from the outside. So it's cold outside, it's 30 degrees outside, and my body's trying to stay 98 degrees. You know, my blood pH, no matter what I eat or how much I exercise, uh, the blood pH is going to stay right around 7.4 it can, you know, I can exercise really, really hard. It might drop down to 7.3, 7. Point, yeah, that's about it, two maybe. And then the buffers kick in and start acting as a as an as a base and picking up the hydrogens. So that's homeostasis. And that's um a pretty good set of stuff to study. Like I said, the required reading really matches up with the um with with the PowerPoints. And I'm, like I said, I've updated the PowerPoints for you guys. So if anybody has any other questions, um, I think I saved my my dinner. I think he only licked it a couple of times. Uh, I guess I can still eat it. <laughs> any rate, anybody have any questions? You guys all good? In psychology, this is called diffusion of responsibility. You're waiting for somebody else. Excellent. All right. Yeah. Thank you guys for joining in and good luck on that, on that test. Uh, it is due Sunday night, time to set five minutes. There is a respond to browser lockdown. Um, other than that, I don't care. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not looking for cheating. I, what I really don't want is, uh, uh, posting the test on online. That's my big thing because you guys are going to all work hard on it. You're going to go read this over and over and over go back to those slides. That's what you should do and study and you're going to work hard and then somebody will go post it and just Google the answers. And that's not fair. So, all right, you guys are more than welcome anytime. It's uh, it's nice to have a little bit of interaction with some of you and thanks for all the top chat. I really appreciate it and really appreciate you guys uh, joining in because I'm, I'm rooting for you to do well, but there's no good. If y'all are all good, I'm going to sign off and uh, you guys have a good night and good weekend. I will check email if there's any problems that pop up on, on the test. So, all right. Till next week.